Welcome to another live segment with the Sacramento Zoo. I'm Laura. And I'm Mike. And we want to thank Greater Sacramento Jiffy Lou for helping sponsor this event. And a big shout out to everybody that's helped us during Big Day of Giving. We have really enjoyed your support and it helps us keep continuing to do what we do. And all the extra support you've given us throughout this time. And again, very much thank you for that. So we would like to wish you guys to stay happy and safe and healthy. And that's what we're here to help you with because soon we hear we might be able to leave our homes and we can go out into nature and see what kind of animals are around and about. And we have native snakes for you that might live right here in Sacramento. And we're gonna to get to look at our first one right now. So. This is Shasta, and Shasta, or squirrel rather, is a gopher snake. Now, she's in here. Not a squirrel snake, a gopher snake. <laughs> and do they eat squirrels? No, they eat gophers. So, let's see if I can pull her, him rather, out. Here he is. So this is squirrel, and squirrel is a Pacific gopher snake. Now, the interesting thing about these guys is they are mimickers. If you take a look at Squirrel's pattern, you'll notice he has these diamond-shaped spots on his back. So when these guys are threatened, they turn their head back, they might coil up, and they actually try and mimic a rattlesnake. So they can use that defense to keep other animals away. So that works really well. Now, uh, Squirrel here, often when we come in to get him out in the morning, he'll use his tail in the dry grasses in his exhibit to make a little bit of that noise. So you guys will have to stay uh, listening for that when you're out in the wild. One thing we should mention too is of course, squirrel, our gopher snake, is a non-venomous snake. We don't have to worry about that. We only really only have one venomous snake to be concerned about here it's in California. True. And that would be of course the rattlesnake. And they give you ample warning. If you get too close, you're going to hear that characteristic buzzing sound. And as Laura mentioned, that's the sound that they mimic. Yeah, and take a look at this head though. Look how narrow and uh, elongated the whole body is. That's pretty characteristic of a gopher snake. A lot of people are out and they say, well, I picked up a snake. I knew it was a gopher snake. Even if you come across a non-venomous snake such as this, we don't touch him out in the wild. Squirrel's actually been handled for education departments for years now. So he's pretty calm. And like every animal, if, you, if they feel like they're threatened, they're gonna try to defend themselves. So a non-venomous snake or a venomous snake, worst case, will use their mouth and the teeth, and that's not a wonderful thing either way. You bet. Now, the other reason these guys, the gopher snakes, are so important to have here in the Central Valley is what they eat. Not only gophers, but mice and rats and little voles, anything. Birds, that, bird eggs, wide variety of prey. Oh yeah, anything that we might not want in our local crops. So gardeners and farmers here in the Central Valley love these snakes because it's natural pest abatement right here in nature. Well, one thing about snakes, you know, not, snakes aren't everybody's favorite animal. But remember, oh, you can see his tail buzzing right Do there. Do you see it? You can see his tail vibrating right now, too. So if he were sitting, or if, if, uh, go, or if our gopher snake was resting in a pile of leaves, that would make a, a real a buzzing sound that, again, mimics that rattle of a rattlesnake. But again, they are predators. They have a special role in, in the environment, basically, being predators of those small rodents, uh, reptiles, other snakes in many cases. Again, birds, bird eggs. So they should really be respected not necessarily feared. Now, there's a question. Since you, you guys are talking about what snakes eat, yes. what might eat snakes? Oh, that's a great question. Fortunately and unfortunately, unfortunately for this snake, fortunately for the bird of prey population, there are a lot of animals that like to eat snakes. Hawks, eagles, animals from above, birds of prey, and even maybe a small cat, like a bobcat might try and take one. So these guys actually are part of the entire food chain right here in California. All right, so mimicry is a very important uh, uh, adaptation for snakes like this. Again, sounding like that more dangerous rattlesnake. Yeah, very, very cool trait. We like this one a lot. Now, Squirrel here came out of the wild. He's actually injured, so he was taken in by Fish and Wildlife, and then once he was uh, repaired and back to health, they used him for education programs. So this snake has been used in education programs throughout the Sacramento Valley for about a decade now. Pretty cool little snake. Well, I'm going to put this one back. We're going to watch him slither right off into his little enclosure here. So as you can see, we give them a real nice home to live in. Even though these animals are out for education programs a lot, this guy gets to have a nice little slither around his home. And he even has a nice little rock wall that one of our trainers, Brooke, built here in the back. So it mimics his natural habitat too. You bet. And this is exactly the kind of topography you find him in. And you can look at this camouflage and you can see how well in the dirt, if you were going on a hike, 
you might not even see these guys. Especially in the grasses, and they do uh, inhabit a wide variety of habitats too. Exactly. Now, when you're out hiking and you come across these snakes, don't be scared. They actually don't hear, they feel the vibrations in the ground, and they'll know you're coming. So when you're hiking on your trail, make sure you stay on those trails. When you're out hiking, you just make that normal sound with your feet and your group coming by, and these snakes will slither off to the side. They really want nothing to do with animals larger than they are, and that includes us. <laughs> Definitely, they know we are predator size, so they want nothing to do with us. And of course, you'll notice his tongue sticking out. It is forked. He's smelling to the left, smelling to the right, trying to figure out if there's any mice, rats, voles, anything that he can eat in his exhibit. And he says, no, not feeding time today. Now, a lot of people want to know how often we feed our snakes here at the zoo. Snakes don't eat every day. Out in the wild, it might take a week to find food. Some snakes can even go six, eight, or 10 months without eating in the wild. We feed our snakes here at the zoo about every 10 days. And one interesting thing too, now we want to give them time to digest. So after feed, actually this is our feeding day this week. And after they do, and actually squirrels are an excellent eater, it gets three thawed out frozen mice and we usually give them about three days off from handling or, or it, that way they can digest their food um, without, any, without any disturbance. Because they're purpose. eating a big meal, like a Thanksgiving meal. So that's why we sit in our barca loungers afterwards and watch football so we can relax and digest. But snakes don't do that. So they eat their big meal and then they slither off to digest maybe under a rock or in the sun. All right, we are gonna move on to our next snake. Much more colorful and no less fascinating though. This is Shasta. And Shasta is a California mountain king snake. Now, an amazing thing about this snake is, of course, his colors. You notice he has these alternating bands of red and black instead of a, a yellowish tan. Well, so happens they, those colors are very important to the snake. Just like squirrel here has camouflage to help him blend in with his surroundings. Well, this guy depends on mimicry to help him defend him, protect him against other predators. In fact, the colors of this snake mimic exactly that of a very venomous snake called a coral snake, which is found in Arizona and in southern parts of our country. Big differences, though, in the arrangement of these bands. You'll see these bands here. Very... Kate's getting a nice close shot there. <laughs> now, you'll notice that black band is touching a red band. Now, there's a little rhyme that goes along with that, but don't depend on it 100%. Now, the, it, it's, some, it's basically red touch black, venom lap, Red touch yellow, kill a fellow. And some of us remember the red touch yellow, uh, kill a fellow, red touch black, okay for Jack. But a lot of variations Mike, of that. Yeah. But as Mike said, you could get all tongue tied twi and miss the comment of which snake is which. So if you see a snake out in the wild, it could be mimicking, it could have a, a, a change in its pattern color, and we just leave them alone. Yeah, that's the best thing. Just whenever you see a snake, just let it, let it go about its business. Now, like nature and everything in nature, there are no hard and fast rules. So there are snakes in like South America that mimic that of our friend, the king snake, our mountain king snake. And people don't realize that. Yeah. Well, even people that think, even in this country, they'll be in the Southern US, they'll see a snake. They'll think about how does that, how does that rhyme go again? Red touch, huh? And then they pick it up and it doesn't end very well for that person. So again, remember snakes are there just to kind of do their job in nature. And the best thing you do is leave them alone. But again, King snakes are fascinating snakes, though. You know, again, these colors are amazing. Um, you'll see them in higher altitudes, up in the foothills and, and towards the mountainous regions of our state. They have a pretty wide range. And, you know, generally, snakes like this, they're going to be hiding out during the daytime, maybe under leaf litter, underground. In fact, our friend uh, Shaster will often be buried, and when we're doing our checks, he'll be buried under a substrate here. So we have to do a little digging around to find him. But generally, though, you know, he's, again, just a super, super attractive snake. And because these guys tend to be at higher altitudes, they actually will hibernate for a longer period of time. I often see these animals up near Colfax and Auburn. And so now that it's sunny and warm, when you guys are heading out from your sequestered at home, you might encounter these guys in pretty good numbers because they're coming out of their hibernation and they're ready for summer and spring and they're ready to begin their lives. And remember, one thing to remember about snakes is they're what some people call cold-blooded animals. Now, one thing about snakes, they are what we call ectotherms. So they're, much, they're very dependent on their surroundings to either find places to warm up when they're cold or to cool off when they're hot. So right now, you might see a snake out on a trail in the mornings, you know, warming up. You know, it's been asleep all night. It wants to get a chance to warm up, and that's when you'd have a chance to see them out. But most of the day, though, when it's warmer, they're going to be in the shade, 
not wanting to be seen or heard or seen by other animals. Now, we have something exciting to share with you because have you guys heard of snakes shedding their skin? It's not their whole skin, really. It's just that outer layer. And this, believe it or not, is Shasta's last shed. So this shedding process depends on growth. So people often ask, how often do these animals shed? Depends on their growth. Just like us, we have to buy more clothes sizes as we grow when we're younger, and we can wear the same clothes for longer when we're older. So young snakes might shed once a month, once every two months, whereas Shasta probably is going about every two to three months now yes, or so. Yeah. And actually, he just shed a few days ago. Yeah. We we're a little concerned about not being able to work with him today because when our snakes are preparing to shed, they go what we call opaque. Basically, the skin is preparing to slough off. And if we can show you here, yeah. The top of the snake right there, those are its eye caps. So when they get ready to shed, their whole scale system comes off here on the top. And we check to make sure the little eye caps came off so they're not retained. Those little monocles aren't retained uh, spectacles on their eyes. And so when that's clouded over, they can't see very well. It's really hard for them. It's like when we have a sunburn, we're kind of itchy, we got that extra skin on. But you can see this is a really good shed and we don't want to handle the snake when they're shedding because they just can't see very well. So we have Ellis, age nine. How do they shed? Like when that kind of gets off, how do they do that? That's a great question, Ellis. They take it off kind of like a wet sock. So it comes off inside out and backwards. They start rubbing their nose on something and it kind of peels off like this. And then they kind of squirm out of it, rubbing on rocks and using their muscles. And then it kind of peels this way and comes off backwards like you take off like an inside out sock taking it off like that and then what's left is this right here and one thing laura was mentioning about the spectacles now the reason they have the spectacle spectacles is snakes don't have eyelids they can't blink they don't close their eyes when they sleep and they depend on those spectacles to protect their eyes so uh again it's part of their shed that spectacle comes off and their eyes are still protected by that new layer of skin now talking about behavior of snakes People want to know, especially when we see them washing up on the shores down in LA, are snakes good swimmers? Turns out all snakes can swim. Some are just better than others. Shasta is a great swimming snake. She prefers warmer water. So here we have some warm water in this nice little tub here. There's not a whole lot of it, but we're going to see if she wants to do some swimming. And there he goes. But you can see he's moving, he's basically slithering the water just like he would move on the ground. So a lot of the sea snakes and snakes that live in the water will actually have a paddle-like tail. And you can see that Shasta doesn't have a paddle-like tail, but you can see that he is perfectly able to just slither across the top of the water. Really cool skills. Now an animal like this is probably not gonna come across water too terribly often, but if they need to get to the other side, the American River, the Sacramento River, not a problem. All right, well, we're gonna pull him out and see if he wants to hang out over there. Now we do have a question from someone who is moving to the foothill, somewhere that maybe this animal might be a little bit closer to home. How do I keep snakes away from the house? Don't mind them living on other parts of the property, just not in the house. Well, one way is to not have, uh, be, be an attractor for the prey. So like these guys would like to feed on mice, try to avoid leaving food out that might attract rodents and other small animals. Chances are, if there's no prey, the snake's going to stay away from your house. Exactly. You want to keep your wood pile for your wood boarding stove away from your property. You want to make sure you're not leaving tons of nesting sites. If you have big boulders, oh, snakes love to stun on boulders and get the rodents that go underneath. So a little bit of property management can help with that. Unfortunately, snakes don't uh, also have uh, great people manners. So they won't listen to you when you say that you don't want them near your home. So you might get some. But know that there is only one dangerous snake here and if you have any questions about what's in your yard there are uh, county and city places that will help you safely remove those animals so you don't have to and they can tell you exactly what kind of snake you have and this is a, a good snake to have around to prevent those Definitely. potentially dangerous ones right yep in fact the next snake that we have is actually a friend to have so if you see this next second snake in your garden you're going to want to make sure it stays perfect all right, let's see who we have over here. This is Lassen, and Lassen is a California king snake, the one that lives more closely down here in the valley. When I'm kayaking on the river or out doing hikes, this is the snake I see most commonly here in the Sacramento area. And as Mike said, the best thing about this one, it's the king snake. It's the king of all snakes. Why is it the king? 
because it'll eat anything, including rattlesnakes. So this animal is actually helpful to humans. And again, he's a predator, just like other, other snakes. And he goes about his way of, of locating prey with his tongue. Like Laura mentioned, he's basically picking up scent particles out of the air with that forked tongue. He knows when prey is approaching. When animals come close enough, he'll strike. Even though he is non-venomous, he still has very, very sharp teeth in his jaws, holds on, and basically wraps his body around and starts to, starts to squeeze or constrict. And a lot of people always thought that, oh, he's suffocating that animal, or he's crushing the skeleton. They've actually found more recently that is actually causing a, a very massive disruption of the, uh, of the blood pressure, cuts off blood to the brain. That animal will expire, that, that prey animal will expire very quickly, and that way minimizes the time there's a struggle. The snake doesn't want to be spending a lot of time trying to just fight with prey. his food. No one wants to fight with their dinner. And again, and king snakes being predators of, of um, other snakes, including rattlesnakes, they have probably the strongest squeezing, constricting pressure of, of strength of any snake you're going to find around here. Yeah, one of the most muscular snakes on the planet, this one right here. Now we're going to watch Lass and do some slithering around. We have one of our education boxes here where our animals get nice exercise. So this is one of the things that our volunteers and our visitors and our guests and our members have been helping us with is building boxes like this so we can allow our animals to get out and get some great exercise in the sun as we come into summer. So this is how you'd see this snake. You're going to be out with your family walking on a trail, picnicking, and you'll see this and you'll notice those striped patterns and it's very, very catching. You'll notice it, you'll see it, and these are great to have around. They swim, they climb trees, they're in the blackberry bushes. They are very dynamic snakes. Now, do you think they camouflage fairly well? Their type of camouflage is actually called disruptive camouflage. While they do have the coloring pattern that helps them blend in, it actually is meant as more of a warning, kind of like bumblebees. If you have bright stripes, it means you're less likely to get eaten. And they're trying to warn other animals, you know what, you just want to maybe leave me alone. So this camouflage actually helps them survive, but it's not the same cryptic camouflage as we noticed with Squirrel, the gopher snake. And again, even with our mountain king snake, as far as wildlife goes, bright colors generally nature indicate an animal that's potentially venomous or poisonous. You know, it's, all, it's our benefit, but also for the snake's benefit when, when other predators are around. That's right. And even though our two snakes are not venomous, just to say, but that mimicry of that venomous snake is very helpful for them surviving out in the wild. You bet. A predator comes, goes to eat it, thinks twice, and while they're thinking twice, the snake can make a hefty escape. Pretty cool. Now, this one also will burrow underground. You can see Lass in there using his head to kind of burrow under our little bark. That's exactly how they would hide out in the wild. They don't have digging skills, but because they don't have arms and legs or shoulders, they can find fit down a very tiny hole out in the wild and escape. And I mentioned before earlier about as far as defenses go. Now, if, a, if an animal's threatened, in many cases they'll try to bite. Many snakes will, of course, use their mouth and their teeth and their jaws. Some snakes will use other ways of defending themselves too. Uh, go, our, our garter snakes, for example, pick one up. There's a good chance it is going to, let's say, just say, pee on you. Not the best thing. We call it musking. Yeah. They have a scent gland and it is not a pleasant smell. And as one of our fellow uh, trainers on our team has found out a couple times recently, so does Lassen. Yes. So again, if you see these animals in the wild, get out your camera. You can get within a few feet, six feet or so. It's always good to stay social distancing from wildlife. So you stay six feet from these guys. They'll do their best to stay six feet from you. And you get a great picture and you can learn a lot about native wildlife right here in your own backyard. And it gets you to fulfill his role out in nature, being a predator of animals we don't necessarily want running around in our environment. That's exactly it. We have a question about how old are some of these snakes? You know, that's a great question. We don't actually know. We, all of these animals are adults. Uh, Lass in here we think is close to 10 years old. Uh, some of the others maybe not as old, but we don't know since they came out of the wild through Fish and Wildlife as they were injured and then made their way to their education department and then finally to us. And that's actually a good question too now. And a lot, some people are probably wondering, well, how old do snakes live? Lifespan. Many snakes can live 20, 30 or more years. So they actually have, can, can have actually a very, very extended lifespan. Right. In like, human care, especially. Right. Our ball python in our education department is 34 years old. Now, so of course, people will always ask, you know, well, do snakes make good pets? Any animal can make a good pet, but they're very specialized. And you really want to do a lot of research. You want to read up into exactly what you're getting into. Know how large that snake's going to be when it becomes an adult. A snake like this, pretty close to full size, at about five feet roughly in length, almost getting close to that. Some snakes, 
Go to the pet store, this big, when it's full grown, six feet, this big around. Do consider that if you're considering And they don't eat pet. vegetables. Right. And they won't eat what you have on your table. So you have to procure mice or some sort of rodent prey or fish, depending on your snake, for them to eat. And that can be really difficult, uh, especially in these times, if you're finding chicken difficult at the store, I imagine mice are in small supply as well. So it's kind of difficult to have these guys as pets often. And we are fortunate all of our snakes do feed on uh, basically thawed out frozen mice. They're already dead. They don't have to do any predation. They don't have to hunt. They don't have to worry about being injured by uh, a rodent that's trying to vet itself. So again, we just provide them with the thawed out frozen mice nicely warmed up and they consider that a perfect meal. Ooh, actually had a question. Yeah. Which one of these three is a better eater? Oh. They're both really good. I mean, they, they're, um, they're very reliable right. eaters actually. Yeah, every single one of them, but I, I'll also go with Lassen. Probably, yeah. <laughs> Lassen <laughs> always knows when it's feeding time. About every uh, 14 days we feed, 10 to 14 days, and uh, he is always ready He's to go. He's always waiting right at his house. And we actually don't feed him in his, well, some of our snakes, we don't feed in their actual house. We found with him, we just put a little plate out and he does perfectly well. Right, if you'd like dinner in your house, it's at the dinner table, not your bedroom, not the sofa or wherever else you might, might want it. And here for our snakes, we make sure that they have a special feeding cage as well. So they know exactly what happens when they're put in that little enclosure. Now you guys talked about with how Shasta's behavior would change, that mountain king snake in the elevation. How would his behavior change in the winter time? Well, these guys are also going to hibernate, although in some areas where it stays warm, they kind of do like a slight torpor kind of thing, and they're not actually... Like brumation, full, yeah. Brumation, yeah. really, and they're not going to like fully go out like you would think a bear would or something. So some of these are active throughout the year. However, reptiles, as Mike said earlier, are cold-blooded. So they're going to really slow down, and there aren't as many rodent populations around in the winter as well in some parts. So they might slow down their eating habits. They might not go swimming as much. They're probably going to stay closer to home and they might find a good portion of their time underground. Okay, we're going to do a last set of questions here. Fortunately, people were asking the same thing around how long is Lassen, this particular king snake? This one, what did we measure? Close to three and a half feet, I think is what we measured. It's just over three and a half feet. And they grow their entire lives, which is why they shed. But in the first few years, they're gonna shed a lot and grow a lot. And then in the last few years, that growth slows down. So Lassen here can get, I would think, another foot or so in his yeah. life. Awesome, thank you. Okay, I think we're gonna get ready to wrap up. Would you guys like to give any closing remarks to the general public? We oh, just, oh, well, go ahead. Oh, I, I wanna say again, once again, we all wanna extend our extreme gratitude to, uh, to Jiffy Lube of Greater Sacramento for supporting our Facebook Live segments and the Sacramento Zoo. Definitely, and all of you at home watching, tuning into these Facebook Live posts, we really appreciate your your support and knowing that we will be here for you guys, for your animal needs. And uh, please stay posted on our Facebook and we'll keep in touch with you. And stay safe, everyone. Stay safe. Bye, guys.